Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and we are pleased and honored to have our guest on the show today. We are bringing him back, but this time solo because he wants to talk and I want to talk about his career as an independent author, Winslow Swan. Swan, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure to have you back on the show. It's great to be back. It so, really is. so, Swan, let's get the first question right out of the bat here. Independent and, author, where's your desire to write come from? Uh, well, I would usually say, as my pat answer to that, it's to get the voices out of my head. Um, but, but that's actually a little bit true because what will happen is I'll get a character or a story and it'll rattle around up here. And until I actually write it down, I'll, I'll just keep thinking about it, thinking about it. So it's basically, it's sort of a, um, oh, what's the word I want? <laughs> a writer who can't think of words. Um, I guess it would be a form of self-exorcism. Were you always a writer? Did you write growing up? Because for those who don't remember, we had uh, Swan and his partner Crimson on the show earlier this year to talk about their YouTube uh, uh, videos that they produce, their audio shows that they do produce online. Uh, Swan is one of the writers, if not the writer of it. And Crimson was one of the actresses who uh, does a lot of the voices along with Swan on the show. So uh, Swan, uh uh, let's let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to the very beginning here. Ooh. Was writing always part of your growing up? You say about getting those voices down on paper, but yeah. writing a book, which we're going to be talking about some of your stories, and writing a play are two different things. So for yeah. you, has it always been one way or the other, or have you always just written just to enjoy writing? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I guess... Thinking back to the very first story I wrote, I think it was about 11 years old. Uh, my mom and I had gone on vacation to Washington, D.C. Flying out, I looked down and saw the city lights going away. And I and for the hour and 15 minute flight, I wrote a little two to three page story about a monster that comes and eats Washington, D.C. You know, and I was 11 at the time. <laughs> so. Um, and then except for uh, really like creative writing classes and English papers and things like that, um, the first big novel I even thought about, I think I was about 16, and I did a 150 page treatment on, which I have now lost. Oh. The story is still up here, and I may get to it eventually. But I also started in radio when I was 15. So I started writing commercials and having to do news and that sort of thing as well. Um, so it was a form of writing too. And I tried to make the commercials as interesting as possible. So they became like mini plays as well. Now, the one of the books that's behind you right now, for those who are watching this via YouTube as we record this, Evil Within is one of the books that I had the pleasure to read. Um, and you you just recently talked about that 11-year-old you writing that story about a monster attacking Washington, D.C. Um, I'm seeing a theme here, Winslow. I'm seeing a, <laughs> I'm seeing a theme. Um, I've listened to your radio show, your YouTube radio show. Uh, I've read your book. Um you got a little of a bit of a horror bug in you, don't you? Oh, yeah. Very much so. And you can blame my mother for that. Why so? She, well, <laughs> I was four years old. And a movie had come out called Whatever Happened to Aunt Alice. Look it up. It's a great film. It was not so much monster horror. It was more suspense, like an Alfred Hitchcock kind of thing. And... My mom and dad went to the drive-in theater. I was supposed to be in the back seat asleep, and instead, I was like this, just fascinated with it. And that gave me my love for horror and suspense and um, and that sort of thing. And as as I grew up watching more and more of these films, because I watched a lot of stuff on TV, not so much the Godzilla and that sort of stuff, but more the Vincent Price and uh, William Castle 
films and you know alfred hitchcock of course yep um but um as my mom would say you're, you're not really scared at these and i say well not really because i'm looking at them from the director's point of view like i would watch a film and go wow i would have changed that you know or i would have put something else in there or something like that so Whereas I'm always looking for the, the twist in the tale or the, you know, the horror theme or something. It's not that I don't watch other things. You know, I do enjoy other genres, but I just kind of gravitate to horror. And I always have. So talking about movies and watching movies, watching the Vincent Price movies, as you said, um, that's a big jump from watching movies as the at looking at it as from a director's perspective to writing and i want to talk about the writing process for a bit because okay. it's always interesting from my perspective to talk to another art uh, an author and ask them how does it start for you you talk about the treatment that 150 page treatment that you've lost but how does the actual pen to paper start for you is it an idea that you've come up with one day is it that little voice in your head that's telling you something what is that first moment that you say i think i have an idea here um when i come up with the ending Really? You start at the end? I start at the end. I'm probably one of the few people that actually start, I write backwards. I start with, like, I'll get an idea for a scene or a, a character or something like that. And I'll think about how I would want it to end. It, it's funny you should mention Evil Within because it literally had four different endings. And then I will start writing and wherever the writing kind of takes me, that's the ending I'll gravitate to. Okay. And, and then that's, that's basically it. I mean, I know a lot of writers will write treatments and they'll have little cards and everything. And this, I don't do that. I just sit down and start writing and then just kind of let it go. And what? especially if I get on a roll, I may not stop for a while. The books that I've been able to read from yours that you uh, sent to me before we sat down and did this, mm -hmm. um, you, you're able to develop a character in a very fascinating way. Um, is it hard for you to write different characters? Because it seems so natural when you're reading the characters, like the Tanners of Evil Within, right? Is yeah. it hard to sit down and say, okay, I'm coming from this as a horror fan, so I need to write these people as nice, innocent, lovely people and then put them through the ringers? Or is it easy for you to do that? It's, it's actually quite easy to develop a character. If I've got a good story, matched with the character and you know well like going back to the uh, the radio place that crimson and i do that is completely typecasting because whereas an actor can play a role on screen or on tv or on the stage or something you know and you can just with the costuming and makeup and everything you can just about do anything but with radio you don't want to have a voice like this playing a five-year-old kid, you know. So it's completely typecasting. But developing the characters has really never been a problem for me because with all of the movies that I've watched and all of the books that I've read and the radio programs that I've listened to over the years, I have this wealth of information. Um, so I'm able to delve into that and and then of course you know people i've met along the way you know i've not to name names or anything like that but some characters are based on people that i've actually met and and uh have interacted with okay the million dollar question has to be asked now because you just you opened it up i want to play uh -oh. in pandora's box here for a few seconds has anyone ever called you out on that read one of your no. books and go that's me why are you writing about me <laughs> actually no wow. it has never ever happened uh the uh, probably the closest that i've come has been 
a few characters that Crimson and I came up with for the show, and we looked and went, oh, that is so you. Or <laughs> that, oh, that is so me. You know, I mean, you know. But other than that, no, no one, no one. Um, uh, uh, yeah, that matter of fact, a lot of my characters, um, especially in one particular book, are based on, you know, real people. But you have to say, you know, not intentionally. <laughs> Not intentionally. If there's any re resemblance to any person out there, this is not intention. But in reality, it totally is, everyone. <laughs> totally is. Yes. So I, I've had uh, another uh, uh, independent horror author on this show. I think he's your friend and my friend as well, David Mercer. Um, and I've always asked him, I, I asked him, but I want to get your opinion as well. How hard is it, how hard is it to kill one of your characters? Because, <laughs> okay, Not Dave, a problem. David was like, it's so hard because they're like part of my child. Dude. You're like, kill them. No, I, I usually have in mind which character is going to bite it pretty much. And I, I have in mind how they're going to die. Um, do you ever read something that you've written about how you've killed someone and go, what the fuck is wrong with my mind thinking that that's how I'm going to kill somebody? Because uh, I, I read horror films, I read horror books all the time, and I go, how, wh what was the author thinking at that moment when they've killed this person or tortured someone? And I'm going, like, is this the inside little voice of Swan telling them to kill him this way? Yeah, if, if you listen to our first episode, um, hats off to Henry, which is one that Crimson wrote. Yep. Um, uh, that was her baby. She, uh, that was a good angel, bad angel kind of scenario. And unfortunately, I have two bad angels right here. You know, oh, oh, you could, you could kill him off with an axe. Yes, but a chainsaw would be so much better. You know. So I'm, you know, it's I don't get too emotionally involved with character the characters because one I know they're gonna die. Um, or get, <laughs> we we did an episode called uh, um, uh, "It Will Drive You Crazy," and in the first act, there's a bartender that Crimson interacts with. She almost cried when he died at the end of the first act. It was like, why did you kill him? Why, 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 why did he have to die? I said, because it moves the story along. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it's the same with the books. It's, it's a device to use the story to, to keep the story moving towards, you know, the end. You've written uh, a numerous books that can be found on places like Amazon Canada, Amazon the US. Uh, I'm assuming other places as well, but it, through oh, Amazon yeah. is where we I can find them and I can send my listeners and my viewers to the Amazon link so that way they can pick up some of your books. Um, in you, you, you started to self-publish kind of at the beginning of the pandemic and then uh, according to... Oh. According to Amazon, they might be done beforehand, so you might be able to correct me here. Yeah, I actually started the first book, which is this one, The Convincer. I don't know if you can see it. Because yep. Okay. This was actually first published in 2011. Oh, wow. Um, it, was, uh, it was probably the easiest one to write. It was my first book, but... I had developed a character so well in my head for years. And I finally got the opportunity to sit down and I went, okay, you're gonna write five pages. And when I say write, I mean pen, paper, arthritis and all. Mm. And there would be days I'd write five pages, there'd be days I'd write 20 pages. It was also the scariest book for me to write because it almost seemed like it wrote itself. And so, there were there were times there were chapters on there where I, I uh, it almost felt like I wasn't really coming up with a story like the story was literally writing itself. 
And I, there were several times I just had to step away and go, okay, wait a minute. It's a very, very dark book. So for my audience and for my listeners who might be intrigued to buy the book, can you talk to me about what The Convincer is all about? Sure. It's actually based on two serial killers. Um, one was from a little town in uh, New Mexico called Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. And the other one, I'd seen a documentary on A&E about a guy called the Iceman, and I can't remember what his real name was, but he was a reported hitman for the mafia. He had something like 85 kills, and he's just bragging about all this, you know. So I put those two characters together as one and came up with Jerry the Convincer. And the thing I, I had been doing a lot of reading, like, um, uh, Alex Cross, uh, I can't remember who writes him, um, uh, but that character, uh, James Patterson and Clyde Kuzler, you know, people like that, Stephen King, of course. Yeah. And <clears throat> I had noticed that with a lot of these books, you would get about that much at the beginning of the killer or, you know, the bad guy. And then you'd have the rest of the book be the detective. And then the last 20 pages, suddenly the detective catches the guy. And I didn't want to write a book like that. The, con the convincer is totally about the killer, about Jerry. Uh, yeah, there is an FBI agent involved. And uh, uh, there, I mean, there's a lot of characters involved. There's a lot going on. But this is about him. I start with uh, one of his kills. And then we follow him as he's growing up, as he gets older, his, his wife. And that is really what the book is about. It, it's when he moves from place to place and what happens in that particular place. How much research goes into a story like that? Because you talk about the two serial killers that uh, Jerry's kind of based off of. I don't want to say, yeah. again, an interpretation. <laughs> interpretation of these two guys. Yeah. But how hard is it to write a character like him? You say it's not that hard for you to write characters, but when it's based on someone that is relatively known, and if someone would read that and go, oh, this is the based on this serial killer, do you try to stay true to the story of what the, the original serial killer is? Or do you go, how he killed or how the serial killer killed? I'm going to take it, but I'm going to put my own little spin on it. I, I think I put my own little spin on, on each one. I mean, the, the convincer actually started the first, very first time I got that idea was many years ago. Um, I'm a big James Bond fan. Okay. And matter of fact, I was watching them recently and I got, all I could hear is the guy from Austin Powers. I got a gun. I'll go get it. We shoot him in the head. I got a gun. <laughs> but, but, um, I came up with a scene with Jerry basically torturing a guy to death. Like it took hours to do. So when, and out of that one scene and how I wanted to end it, that's how Jerry came about. I had no idea about the two serial killers. And then I started doing, uh, I read a book about the truth or consequences uh, guy. And then I saw the A&E thing and I thought, I could put this, there's my Jerry right there. There's my Jerry. Yeah, so I basically added a lot. I mean, Jerry is, he's a family man. He has a wife, he has two kids, or set kids, but he has two children. Um, he, he works hard, he has his own business, but he does other things as well, you know, not just, I mean, he, he's not just a serial killer like, uh, like, uh, you know, like the guy like, oh, I'm going to kill you now. Yeah. You know, you know, and, then, and then it's just over and over and over again. You know, there's always a reason behind each of the, the slayings in the convincing. You, you are an independent off, uh, publisher. You've published uh, some of your books independently, if I'm not mistaken, correct? If all not all, all of them. <laughs> yeah. Take me through the process of, as an independent author, publishing your work independently and why you chose to do that um well well getting it out to, i mean publishing it isn't really that hard um 
I was lucky enough, I have a very good friend of mine who published a book called uh, Down and Dirty. It was a history of the exploitation film in Hollywood. Um, it's actually being used in film schools in California as a textbook. And he directed me to um, uh, a site called smashwords.com. Uh, Mike Coker was the guy that created that. He was an author as well, and he wanted to give independent authors a platform. And as long as you went by their formatting and all this, because you know computers are our friends, um, you know they would put it out there, and it would be an ebook. And it wasn't until recently, I forgot what year you said, that I started putting the stuff up on Amazon. On Amazon, it says 2020. November yeah, 23rd it, is yeah, when you I first published. 2020 when I, I started basically putting them on Amazon. I mean, they're still on Smashwords. And both of those uh, companies distribute ebooks like all over, like I'm at walmart.com. <laughs> But, I, you know, it's just a lot of different platforms uh, for the books. The biggest thing is the promotion and, and getting the name, you know, like my name, Winslow Swan, out to the public. And maybe they'll pick it up. And that was the whole idea behind the radio show, which is now in our fifth season. 62 shows produced. We started another series called The Case Book of Sydney Chase because we love the character so much. <laughs> Crimson plays Sydney. I play her friend, Dr. Alex McDougal. Well, I'm sorry, McDougal. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, you know, and, and so that started as a series too, but the whole idea was to try to get the name out there. And the problem with it is that if you don't have a whole lot of money to shove into publicity, promotion, um, you know, uh, uh, media marketing, thank you, marketing, um, it's really, really, really tough to get your name out there. That's why I like people like you. We can, we can come on here and, you know, Promote it as much as possible. Exactly. Winslowswan.com. Yeah, which for anyone who's <laughs> listening and uh, watching this, the links to Winslow's website and also the link to the Amazon page where you can pick up, if I'm not mistaken, a paperback uh, version of the book, of all of his books, actually. I shouldn't say yeah. of his book, but all of his books are there. Um, or, or ebooks. Or ebooks. Sorry. Yes, you are correct. For those who just heard a little voice in the background, Crimson is in the room as we record this. Oh my God. Oh my God. You're such a tattletale. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Crimson. Right now, she is not going to come on camera. No. She may stick her head in, but that's about it. No, I am behind the camera today. This is, no, I'm just chilling. I'm just hanging out with my Chilling, bestie. which is good. Take me through the process because you, you, as an independent publisher, you have to edit. You have to ensure that what you're going to be putting out is the final version because you don't have thousands of eyes. Like if you're a big publisher looking at your story, you have one eye or crimson in your eyes to read the book. I, so how does that work for you? <laughs> well, the editing, since I've met crimson, she has done my editing work. She only, only for the twisted fantasy. Ten, ten twisted ten. Uh, no, you did. Uh, didn't you do bits and pieces? The great thing about having friends in the same room while recording a story, you get to listen to their conversation about how the story actually is to unfold during yeah. a live episode. <laughs> yeah. Um, My apologies. Uh, no, yeah. it's okay, Crimson. We love you. <laughs> she, she uh, um, uh, we have actually written a book together that we have yet to sit down and edit. Now who's the tattletale? I know. But, um, I mean, it's a great story. She came up with this story. 
she gave me this huge outline and said, could, could you make sense of this? So I started writing it and I've written it and we just have yet to sit down and edit because we're so busy doing the plates. But before I met Crimson, yeah, I had to do Everything. all the editing, the proofreading and everything. I did have a couple of friends that would look over it. And I noticed the one big challenge that I have about myself. I <laughs> tend to change the name of characters halfway <laughs> through the book. That started with the very first book. That's actually happened with the radio plays. That started <laughs> with, uh, 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 it was Evil Within, actually. Bobby became Billy. Yes. And then Billy became Bobby. And so, I had just met you. Yes. And you gave me the, the e-book um, uh -huh. e thing. And I was like, well, you called Billy Bobby or Bobby Billy. Exactly. And so, you said, probably <laughs> yeah pro probably because i have a really bad habit i'm honestly i'm kind of lazy as uh, when it comes to writing if i stop and i don't make notes if i stop at a certain point then i'll come to that point and then just keep going again and i'm too lazy to scroll back through to see what i named the character Go unless by unless it's you know the main character or something but even then i have changed the names of characters so yeah i i have to do all the editing and then there's the uh uh, uh formatting on the computer so you know ebook readers will read it correctly and all this and then you have to upload it and then it usually gets sent back while well, you've made a mistake and you have to redo it, you know, there and was it's, me. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's hard. I mean, it really is. Do you, what advice would you give independent uh, authors right now going through the same thing? Because, uh, for transparency's sake, I, I guess uh, by the time this airs, it should hopefully be officially edited, but uh, we are publishing our first novel here in the next few months. Hopefully by December, we will have it out. Um, what advice would you give independent authors who are about to publish their first story or their first book? Run. <laughs> Pull it back. Run. No. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm, uh, don't take this seriously. Um, well, one, if you're going to be a writer or an author, the first job is to sit down and write. I have met so many people that said, well, I have this idea for this story or I have this idea for this book. But as soon as you say, well, you should sit down and write it, it never happens. Writers are a special breed of insanity. What if they've and already written if, it? If they've already written something and they're ready to publish, you can go the route of trying to find an agent, send it to the publishers, send out letters and all this mess. And money. And money. Lots of money. Or you can self-publish like first. I did. At least first. And at least try it that way. And then, but then you run the risk of having to self-promote, market, and, and do all of that. One of our actresses is Annie Mick. She's got some great books out there and she runs into the same problem that I do. It's the marketing. I've never been good at marketing. I was in radio for 20 years and I've never been good at marketing. I can write the commercial. I can make the commercial. I can put it on the air, but marketing a brand or something, it's very, very difficult. If you have a little money and to spend though. If you have the money to spend. And I stress this, if you have the money to spend, there are people out there that will help you with marketing and not at like, an, I mean, there are people out there that'll charge you a couple of thousand dollars too, you know, and just run with but, that. And then, but, you know, <laughs> but there are some people out there that will help. And especially if you have friends who are willing, friends and being one of them, who are willing to promote you and, and put your name out there on just basically everything. Yeah. You know, go, you go through Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, you know, right now all I have is Facebook and Twitter because I just don't have the time to go on there and do everything that needs to be done. 
even going to the grocery store if you see someone yes. with a book in their car or something yeah. and they're loading their groceries up that's a perfect time to go say hello yeah <laughs> hi you, you got to really be a people person yes. too. If, if, if you're if you've got a book out there um i carry a box uh, of uh books with me and we'll go out together like to the grocery store or something and to start talking to people. Oh, well, I have, you know, would, would you, here, here's a copy and I'll sign it for them. It's another way of getting your name out there. And that's the biggest challenge is getting your name out yes. there. You know, not all of us can be Stephen King. That's a hurdle. So. And that's true. And especially with the, uh, the market, the way it is right now, right? Because there's a lot of independent publishers and a lot of independent authors who, have great ideas who like yourself have flooded the market i shouldn't say flooded the market but have put their stuff out there so it's yeah. competing against other independent authors as well <laughs> and while we're the uh, the uh author community is so tight-knit and i say that with respect because i have found you guys have been amazing like uh authors from all across the country and even the United States here in Canada and the United States have started reaching out to me because they're like, Oh, and uh, uh, like a show will have authors on. And I'm like shocked at how quick this has spawned into the cross border interviews talks about politics and authors now, which is yeah. great because I get to read. Um, so we, 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 we talk about, uh, standing out and marketing is one of the of the hardest challenges of a independent author like yourself but you wouldn't continue doing it if you didn't love it right you wouldn't because i that I, you, the, that is the biggest thing you really gotta love like i said writers are a different kind that's a different kind of insanity we're different because breed. you're you're a different breed of person you do it because you just you love to do it you don't go into it saying okay this is going to be my job this is going to be my career yeah. you do it because you love to do it i i will still listen to the old shows to hear my writing come to life i've got three audio books out there um because um not speaking out of term, Crimson is dyslexic. Her. And I, when I first met her, I said, oh, well, I have these on audiobooks. So she got the audiobooks <laughs> and they're all short stories. So you don't have to sit there and listen to the whole book. You can yeah, piece like, it out. You know, they're just little between 10 stories. Between 15 minutes, it was and great. So I'll still go back and listen. Now, I'll even go back and read some of the stories as well, basically for my own enjoyment. And if you don't love the the writing and all that, then you really have no business being a writer exactly. because it's going to come across in the writing. Yes, it will. That it's just you know you're just kind of doing it. And I've and I've seen that happen with a lot of. I'm not going to mention any names of authors, but I've seen that happen as the years go by. It, it's almost like the the books are getting formulaic. Um, they get stale, you know, and yeah. if, I have told Crimson this, if I ever start doing that in any of the writing, be it the plays or books or short stories or whatever, let me know. And I do. Don't, and she will. She will. <laughs> She's brutally honest. So, so as I, a, oh, go continue on. Sorry, I apologize. I, I, was, I was just going to say that um, if you don't enjoy the writing, don't. then don't do it. So let's get let's get back to you for a second here. It's great that we could chat about that for a few minutes, but I want to I want to uh, wrap up with this. You have written uh, quite a few a uh, handful of books, I will say, and uh, okay. I know you are you have published uh, past uh, radio shows, the scripts of the radio show for people to read as well. Yeah. Um, is there a connection? Is there a connection from the books? to the radio show would we ever see uh the tanners possibly show up in one of your radio shows later on in the future or I, have they or other uh, other uh characters in your books have they shown up in your radio show so that way when people might pick up the uh the uh, evil within and they say well i, I want to know how how this continues on so is there potentially a <laughs> spin-off but <laughs> 
Yeah, that that was asked of me about the convincer. If yeah. I was going to do a sequel to the convincer, and I said no. I, in the first place, I don't like sequels. Um, I don't mind continuing stories if if the story can remain interesting. Uh, like on the radio show, we have two running kind of shows with continuing characters. Case Book of Sydney Chase, and we do the Haunting series about a little four little ghosts. Um, and it's more of a comedic thing. But when it comes to like uh, the books like The Convincer or Evil Within or even bits and pieces and everything, I like to leave that ending to where the reader has to take it up from there. So it's basically like whatever. Crimson hates my stories. Yes, I, she, I she hates them because she'll get to the ending. She go, no. No, but what happens after that? You can't stop. And right, right. you like, can't no. stop now. So you what know? happens? <laughs> but um, yeah, we I have actually done. Well, we've actually done about two or three plays based on short stories. Uh, Red Hat Society was one, and that was the first show of the second season. Um, I'm trying to remember what the other ones were. We were, we were going to do one called Behind the Door. And that's still in the works right now. But, and that's as far as I know, that's it. But I've uh, uh, one of our other actors asked us about Evil Within, maybe turning it into a, like a mini series kind of thing. And I would lean toward that. I would like to hear that as like an audio play. Because I think it's a very interesting story. Um, I enjoyed writing it. You know, I like I said, I had four different endings to it, and I just kind of gravitated to one. But um, uh, I wouldn't mind putting the convincer as a radio play, but that would definitely be for adults mm -hmm. only. That's a, I actually put a warning on that book. No one under thirty-five should read it. You've I mean, just basically that, guaranteed every fourteen-year-old kid who is listening to this going. <laughs> need to read this book no <laughs> no <laughs> my uh, that was uh it was a very dark time in my life and that's a very dark book it so. made me gas yes so when you hear uh comments that crimson just made like it made me gasp it made me jump it made me uh question your mental stability swad what does that make you feel <laughs> Oh, you're you're too young to remember Dudley Do Right and Muttley, and all that. Muttley was a dog, and he would go, mm, mm. "That's what it makes me feel like." I feel like my job has been done. That, um, and I think every horror writer feels feels that way. That you go in, you know, you don't purposely go in and make a bad movie or a, a you know a bad book. Or, or anything like that. The point of horror is to grab that emotion, to, to make it a roller coaster ride, because it's basically what horror is, is a roller coaster ride. You have these ups and then you suddenly go right down. And if I can get a reader to get that emotion, to when they turn the page and go, oh, I've done my job. My work is done. There were parts yeah. where I wanted to get off that roller coaster on yeah. that book, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's too good. Um, so I guess we have to end with this. Um, you have you and Crimson have been focusing on the radio show more prevalently than writing books right now, but right. could my listeners and viewers potentially see a new Winslow Salon book uh, come out in 2023 or 2022? I I'm actually wanting to go back. I actually have two books right now on my desktop, on the laptop. Uh, one of them is the one I talked about earlier that Crimson and I did together. And another one, we had actually started editing and got about halfway through when Doorway to Nightmare kind of exploded. Uh, it's called Ashes to Dust. It's a, a sort of an end of the world kind of thing. Um, and uh, she, she was uh, editing that one for me. And like I said, then we got involved with the radio series and all that. 
But um, yeah, I would love to get those two published preferably preferably in 2022, but it's almost September now. So I'm looking at 2022, at least to start getting it out there. And, um, and then Crimson gave me an idea of taking some of the plays and actually turning them into short stories, just as regular stories mm -hmm. instead of you know the play. And then I can delve more into uh, the, some of the characters, get, get, give a little more character development. To them and maybe expand on the stories a little bit. So that's actually another project that I've been thinking about as well. You have a lot yeah, to think about. I do. I have a lot going <clears throat> on up here. And it's a scary place up here sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I look forward to what that crazy place brings us in the end of 2022 and 2023. Um, Swan, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and doing this. Uh, oh, it's always Chris, a pleasure to have you on the show. You, you are a, uh, you're a godsend for independent authors. Uh, just, just keep it up. That's all I can tell you to do. And thank you. And good luck with yours. Well, thank you. I will send you a copy of it once yes, it's done. Please. So that way you can get a copy and you could read all about the last three. It's not a, it's not a novel. It's a biography. So it's the last three years of my life and everything that's gone on with me. But um, Winslow, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been uh, an honor to have you on the show. Oh, and when the next reason. book comes out, I will have you back on the show to do another promotion of it. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. And uh, I know she was in the back, but if you want us back on again to talk about the radio show, we'll do that too. We might have you back in October for a Halloween edition. Oh, with yeah. we, we are doing a Halloween episode. A Halloween special. Uh, a Halloween special. It'll be an extra episode for the fifth season. Well, we might That's have to bring a round table discussion about the horror genre in particular yeah. with you and David because uh, our other independent author, you know David, right? I, I mean, I know him through Twitter, yeah. Yeah, well, I will, we, we will officially introduce you guys by a round table and talk about the horror genre in particular. Crimson, Winslow, uh, Crimson, Swan, David, and Chris talking about horror. That's so what, that, that's what, 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 what could go wrong with two crazy people who have really <laughs> upsetting things in their head 24 7, seven days a week? Oh. And a guy up in Canada going, Oh, this is too much for us Canadians, eh? <laughs> <laughs> So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in and watching this great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Uh, for all, like I said, during the interview, if you want to pick up a copy of any one of Swan's books, follow him on Twitter, follow his YouTube channel that he does radio shows with Crimson, and just support independent authors because we they, they need it much more than those high-floating not that they're bad because I'd love to have Stephen King on the show one day, <laughs> but support independent authors and just read because it is a dying art form out there. And I think we all need to get back into it. So with that, I want to thank everyone for, Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, it's just like the movies, you know, the movies have become so formulaic, even horror movies. Yeah. And the ones you see getting the most press are the independent ones. Now the ones yeah. that didn't spend you know, $80 million. They spent like six or seven grand and made this movie and it's actually a really good movie. And you sometimes know, much better. Them, but, you know, there's some gems out there. That's, support the independence. But support the independence, yes. yes. That's true. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in and watching the cross board interviews with Chris Brand. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, get out from behind social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our democracy. It helps our society. It helps us as a better people, make, make us a better people. So with that, have yourself an excellent day and talk to you guys later.